let's see. Okay, I want you to turn your Bibles today to John's Gospel, chapter 17. I'm just going to read a couple of verses from this chapter. John's Gospel, chapter 17. The context here is that in the previous chapters, Jesus has been talking to His disciples. And uh, this is during the occasion of the Last Supper. The other, the other three Gospels do not record all of the discourse and all of the talk. They just record that they had the Last Supper and He took the bread and the wine. John, however, in his Gospel tells us all of the discussion and all the things Jesus said to His disciples before He went away and went to the cross. He gave them some final instructions. He washed their feet. We read that last week in John chapter 13. And uh, He gave them instructions in chapter 14, 15, 16 and told about the, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit that He would send uh, after He'd returned to the Father. Then in John chapter 17, the entire chapter is devoted to a prayer that Jesus begins to pray. And uh, it's very good and it's very interesting. We could learn a lot from reading the whole chapter, but uh, what I want is just a couple of things that he says. And uh, actually, I, I only want uh, verse uh, 6, and, um, and then I'm going to read you also verse 25 and 26. This is in his prayer. And Jesus says, he's praying to the Father, and he says in verse 6, John chapter 17, verse 6, I have manifested thy name, speaking to God, speaking to the Father. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, now they, uh, and they have kept thy word. Chapter, chapter 17, verse 25 says in the conclusion of this prayer, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that Thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them Thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith Thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them." Now, maybe you notice the, the two things that are in common with these two verses. He said uh, in, in verse 6, I have manifested Thy name unto them, and in verse 26 He said, I have declared unto them Thy name. Now, I think this is very important uh, because who God is called and what is what how he's named has everything to do with the relationship between the person naming him that way in other words uh, how he is in relation to uh, to us in the old testament for instance uh, when Moses went up on the mountain and saw the burning bush if you remember that story maybe you've seen the movie with Charlton Heston that's a pretty good part of that movie but he sees the burning bush and he's, he hears God speak to him out of the burning bush and he says take your shoes off from your feet for the ground you're standing on is holy and he sent Moses to deliver the children of Israel from their captivity and bondage and then Moses says to the Lord who's speaking to him from the burning bush whom shall I say he said they won't listen to me whom shall I say has sent me and in the King James translation, it says, Say to them, I am that I am hath sent thee. Now that expression translated, I am that I am, if you notice in the King James, it's printed in all capital letters in that verse. It's actually the Hebrew word Yahweh, which we translate as Jehovah. He gave him that name. It's a name of, uh, of awesome, uh, sort of fearful majesty, the name of Jehovah. Um, and and the, that was the name used for God throughout the Old Testament primarily, although in the earlier chapters of Genesis and in other places there are some other names that are used for God in Hebrew, El Elyon and El Shaddai and names of that kind. But Jehovah was the big name used for God. It is a name of uh, held by the Jews in great reverence and, and fear and awe. And, and it's said that uh, tradition tells us that the scribes, when they would copy the scriptures, when they would come to the name of God, they would uh, be so afraid to write it down and with such fear they would, and reverence they would go and wash and purify themselves before they would even write the name. And they were reluctant even to say it aloud and so they substituted, in, living in a Greek-speaking world, they began to substitute the Greek word Adonai, which is translated Lord. Many times in the Old Testament when you see the word Lord in all capital letters, it's the Hebrew word Yahweh, which the word Lord has been substituted for. Such reverence and majesty did they hold that name. And, um, and I might as well say this, since it's kind of along, the lines, it, along these lines, if, when people that come to your door and try to give you religious literature, there's a couple of different groups. One of those is the Jehovah's Witnesses. And that's one of their big uh, issues with the church world, uh, that they think they are right and we, everybody else is wrong. They want Him to be still called God, to be still called Jehovah. But I must point this out to you, that Jesus, in, this, in these 
verses that I read to you when he said, I have manifested thy name, speaking to God, to his Father. I have manifested thy name, I have revealed thy name. Jesus did not use the name Jehovah when he talked about God in his ministry. Jesus did not reveal God by the name of Jehovah. Jesus used a far more intimate and a far a, a word that implies a completely different kind of relationship. Jehovah was a God who had servants and worshipers. And He was a God at a distance, a God to be feared. He came down on the mountaintop with fire and uh, the people were afraid of Him. That is not the God that Jesus introduces, although it's the same God, but that is not the relationship that we have with God. Jesus, when the Scripture says, I have manifested Thy name, many times some other translations say it this way, instead of saying, I have manifested Thy name, sometimes other translations will say, I have shown them what You're really like. The name always refers to what the nature is. Uh, Elliot, go, or are you running? Elliot, give me a verse six again, where it says, "I have manifested Thy name." You notice it says, "I have manifested or made real or uh, made evident or revealed Your name." Uh, give me the message. I want to show you what the message does with this. I have spelled out Your character in detail. You see. The reason, and the message is not the only translation that does this, the reason other translations say, I have shown people what you're really like, or I have spelled out your character in detail, is because the name has everything to do with revealing who it is that's being so named. And I want you to know today that Jesus, when He talked about God, did not say Jehovah, and he, generally. He did not say El Elyon or El Shaddai. He called Him Father. Jesus, when, he, when the disciples said, teach us to pray, he didn't say, when you pray, say, Almighty Jehovah, uh, whom we fear. He said, say, Father. You see, the word Father carries with it a, a, a different kind of relationship. You know, Paul, when he's writing to the uh, Galatians, he said, you are no more servants but sons. And why is it that we can have this relationship with God that Jesus reveals to us? He brings this to light. He manifests to it. It's because Jesus is the Son of God. And all of those of us who believe in Jesus can now relate to God through Him as sons of God. Through the Son of God. Uh, there's a really interesting way of saying this in John's Gospel, chapter 1. Let me just look at this for a minute. Go back to John's Gospel. Same Gospel we're in right now. Just turn back to chapter 1 and start with verse uh, uh, 10. You notice in this prayer, He said, The world has not known you, He said to the Father. He said, The world does not know you, but I know you. Here it talks, speaking of Jesus... Uh, verse 10 says, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. That's what He said in that prayer. The world does not know you. He came to reveal, can I say it this way? Jesus, amongst other things, came to reveal to us what God is really like, what, he, what His true, real nature is. Well, somebody might say, well, don't we see what His true, real nature is in the Old Testament? Well, let me say emphatically, no. We do not see God's true nature in the Old Testament. We see a distorted image. It's a distorted image of God. Have you ever uh, driven on, on a trip and you drive through a long, flat area, maybe like a desert, you know, and it's really hot, and you see on the horizon it's all wavy, and, you know, those wavy lines, the heat lines. See, what you're seeing through that, that waviness is distorted, right? The heat distorts what you see. Would you agree with that? In the Old Testament, the view or the image or the, uh, the, the way we see God portrayed in the Old Testament is distorted by sin by unresolved sin. But Jesus has come to take sin out of the mix. You know, he, has, he has so sufficiently dealt with sin that those who accept and believe in Jesus can now relate to God without that distorting factor of sin uh, 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 distracting. Uh, God can uh, give His love to us without anything diluting it or distracting or... Uh, what's the word I want? Um, uh, distorting that relationship. And here it says in verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. He came to His own, and His own received Him not. Who were His own that He came to that did not receive Him? Well, it was the Old Testament people of God. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the covenant people of God in the Old Testament. The nation of Israel, who were in covenant with God. Who Jesus came at, to whom Jesus came as the last prophet of that system. Uh, the last messenger from God in that covenant. He also is the establisher of the new covenant, but His own at that time who did not receive Him were all of those in the nation of Israel who did not receive Him. Primarily, He was rejected by the majority. Only a few, only a remnant, Paul says. Only a remnant believed in Him. A very small number. 
Paul was not even one of those. Paul was one of those who rejected him first time around. It was not until after his death, burial, and resurrection that the Apostle Paul, who was then called Saul, he was one of the Pharisees during Jesus' ministry. A lot of, most of them, the, the, the leaders, rejected him. So he came to his own, but his own did not receive him.